Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., Reverend Dr. George M. Doherty. She has cut the sermon down significantly from its original 10 pages, but is confident that you will have no difficulty grasping the powerful impact it had on those in attendance that day. Please be aware that some of the language and the terminology of the sermon, though not derogatory, would likely fall into political incorrectness today, but it is representative of the point in history in which it was written. Please help me welcome Lynn P. Jabal. The sermon that I'm about to read was preached for Lincoln Day on Sunday, February 7, 1954, before Dwight D. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Suggesting that the words under God be added to the Pledge of Allegiance. At this season of anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln, it will not be inappropriate to speak about freedom and what is called the American way of life. Freedom is a subject everyone seems to be talking about without seemingly stopping to ask the rather basic question, what do we mean by freedom? The world of Mr. Lincoln's day is unbelievably different from this modern age. Yet there is a sense in which history is always repeating itself. The issues we face today are precisely the issues Lincoln spent his life seeking to resolve. In his day, the issue was sparked by Negro slavery, Today, it is sparked by a militantly atheistic communism that has already enslaved 800 million of the peoples of the earth and now menaces the rest of the free world. Let me describe what the American way of life is. It is going to the ball game and eating popcorn and drinking Coca-Cola. It is shopping in Sears and Roebuck. It is losing heart and hat on a roller coaster. It is driving on the right side of the road and putting up at motels on a long journey. It is being bored with television commercials. It is setting up firecrackers with your children on the 4th of July. But it is more than that. It is gardens with no fences to bar, bar you from the neighborliness of your neighbor. It is the perfume of honeysuckle and the sound of katydids in the warm air of summer when you go into the garden the children long ago asleep and you feel the pulse and throb of nature around you. It is Thanksgiving turkey and pumpkin pie. It is the sweep of broad rivers and the sea of wheat and grass. It is canyons of skyscrapers in New York and the sweep of Lakeshore Drive that is Chicago. It is a Sunday New York Times. It is sitting on the porch on a Sunday afternoon after morning church, rocking in a creaking wicker chair. It is a solitary bugler player playing taps, clear and long noted at Arlington. And where did all this come from? It has been with us so long, we have to recall it was brought here by people who laid stress on fundamentals. They called themselves Puritans because they wished to live the pure and noble life, purged of all idolatry and enslavement of, of the mind, even by the church. They did not realize that in fleeing from tyranny and setting up a new life in a new world, they were to be the fathers of a mighty nation. These fundamental concepts of life had been given to the world from Mount where the moral law was graven upon tables of stone, symbolizing the universal application to all men. And they came from the New Testament, where they hoard in the words of Jesus of Nazareth, the living word of God for the world. This is the American way of life. Wherefore, Lincoln claims that it is under God that this nation shall know a new birth of freedom, and by application, it is under God that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not 
perish from the earth. Now all this may seem obvious until one sits down and takes these implications of freedom really seriously. For me, it came in a flash one day some time ago when our children came home from school. Almost casually I asked what happened at school when they arrived there in the morning. They described to me in great detail the ritual of the salute of the flag. The children turn to the flag, and with their hand across their heart, they repeat the words, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and the republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. They were proud of the pledge, and rightly so, Going over each word slowly in my mind, I came to a strange conclusion. There was something missing in this pledge, and that which was missing was the characteristic and definitive factor in the American way of life. Indeed, apart from the mention of the phrase the United States of America, this could be the pledge of any republic. In fact, I could hear little Muscovites repeat a similar pledge to their hammer and sickle flag in Moscow with equal solemnity, for Russia is also a republic that claims to have overthrown the, thrown the tyranny of kingship. Russia also claims to be indivisible. Mr. Stalin admitted to Sir Winston Churchill that the uniting of the peasants was the most difficult of all his tasks. He didn't mention the massacre of the three million Kulak farmers in this blood and iron unification. Russia claims to have liberty. Karl Marx in his dialectic makes it clear that the communist state is only in a perfect stage towards world communism. Utopia then will have dawned. Until that day, there must be personal limitations. They might claim that their servitude is perfect freedom. The communists claim there is justice in Russia. They call their way of life democratic. What, therefore, is missing in the Pledge of Allegiance that Americans have been saying on and off since 1892 and officially since 1942? It is the one fundamental concept that completely and ultimately separates communist Russia from the democratic institutions of this country. This was seen clearly one nation under God, this people shall know a new birth of freedom and under God of infinite terms. Lincoln was simply reminding the people of the basis upon which the nation won its freedom and its declaration of independence. Listen again to the fundamentals of this declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unending alienable rights, that among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The tragedy of the 19th century democratic liberalism when nation after nation set up parliamentary forms of government was that two world convulsions shattered the illusion that you can build a nation on human ideas without a fundamental belief in God's providence. Crowns in Europe not because of autocracy, but because the people had lost the vision of God. We face today a theological war. It is not basically a conflict between two political philosophies, nor is it a conflict fundamentally between two economic systems. It is a fight for the freedom of human personality. It is the view of man as it comes down to us from the Judeo-Christian civilization in mortal combat against modern, secularized, godless humanity. The Pledge of Allegiance seems to me to omit this theological implication that is inherent within the American way of life. It should be one nation, indivisible, under God. Once under God, then we can define what we mean by liberty and justice for all. To omit the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance is to omit the definitive character of the American way of life. Some might assert this to be a violation.
violation of the First Amendment to the Constitution. It is quite the opposite. The First Amendment is concerned with the question of religious religion. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Meaning that Congress will permit no state church in this land, such as exists in England. In England, the bishops are appointed by Her Majesty. The church by law is supported by rent. The church, therefore, can call upon the support of the law of the land to carry out its own ecclesiastical laws. What the Declaration says, in effect, is that no state church shall, shall exist in this land. This separation of church and state. It is not and never was meant to be a separation of religion and life. If we were to add the phrase under the church, that would be different. In fact, it would be dangerous. The question arises, which church? Now I could give good Methodists an excellent dissertation upon the virtues of the Presbyterian church and show how much superior John Knox was to John Wesley. But the whole sad story of church history shows of all tyrants, often the church could be the worst for the best of reasons. The Jewish church persecuted unto death the Christian church in the first decades of Christianity. <coughs> the Christian church persecuted the Jewish church. The Roman church persecuted the Protestants, and the Protestants in turn persecuted the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians brought low the very name of Christian charity, both in Scotland and America. No church is invalid, and no church is invalid. Of course, as Christians, we might include the words under Jesus Christ or under the King of Kings, but one of the glories of this land is that it has opened the gates to all men, every religion. There is no religious examination on entering the USA, no persecution because a man's faith differs even from the Christian religion. So, it must be under God. To include the great Jewish community and the people of the Muslim faith and the myriad of denominations of Christians in the land. What then of the honest atheist? Philosophically speaking, atheistic American is a contradiction in terms. Now don't misunderstand me. This age has thrown up a new age of man. We call him a secular. But they really are spiritual parasites. And I mean no term of abuse in this. I'm simply classifying them. A parasite is an organism that lives upon the life force of another organism without contributing to the life of the other. These seculars are living upon the accumulated spiritual capital of a Judeo-Christian civilization and at the same time deny the God who revealed the divine principles upon which the, the ethics of this country grow. If we deny the existence of the God who gave us life, how can we live by the liberty he gave us at the same time? This is a God. Our coins bearing the imprints of Lincoln and Jefferson are the words in God we trust. Congress is opened with prayer. It is upon the Holy Bible the President takes his oath of office. Naturalized citizens, when they take their oath of allegiance, conclude solemnly with the words, so help me God. This freedom that respects the rights of the minorities but is defined by a fundamental belief in God. In this land, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for we are one nation, indivisible, under God. And humbly, as God has given us the light, we seek liberty and justice. introduced the State Senate Joint Resolution SJ-126. And just 
four months later, on June 14, 1954, Flag Day, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the bill into law, officially adding the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. What a difference one powerfully passionate speech can make. And we are still one nation. 